So one of the things I liked about this video is that the title says how to rev up your sex drive with sensate focus techniques. They aren't necessarily saying that a person has any kind of disorder or something like that, and then they would need this treatment. Instead, it's um, sensate focus is one of those techniques that can be used just to boost, you know, sexual pleasure and arousal and other things all the time. So while it's oftentimes used for dysfunction, um, it can be used by anyone. And in fact, if you pick up, I don't know, an issue of Cosmo or Glamour or something, and it has you know, six steps to mind blowing orgasms, it's always sensate focus. It's always some variation on the techniques that are involved in sensate focus. So it's a really well known, really effective. It also, you know, it's completely free. And it just is um, kind of returns people back to their their younger when, you know, sex was like, not so rudimentary or what would you call it um, run of the mill that a lot of times couples will experience stuff like that and just sort of put you back in that passionate mindset so having said all that you might think well then how's it working for premature ejaculation if it's actually making it more exciting but the goal is that you're sort of just enjoying the sensations rather than focusing on orgasm all right, so what about the biological treatments for premature ejaculation? There are medications that are targeting the different hormone levels and things like that. Um, don't look up stuff on the internet and buy things that, you know, say they should work because you don't know what all is in there. Um, I found this one, it's called Delay. I mean, one of the best ways that you can tell that it's not really um, FDA approved medicine is first off the, <laughs> the title, Premature Ejaculation Medicine. Hmm. That sounds credible. Um, second off, the FDA prohibits us from naming medications with like super obvious names. Like you could not name a premature ejaculation medicine, delay. Um, you'd have to have some kind of, that's why we get these weird names that we see on, on medicines. You're like, what is that? It's like the, uh, the first two letters come from the chemical compound and then the th last three letters come from the inventor's name or something <laughs> like these made up names. Um, delay would not be an appropriate FDA approved title for a medicine. Um, but the things about uh, things that you might find on the internet and you might think, well, you know, how, you know, um, herbal is better or whatever. Ways that you can tell whether something's tr trustworthy. One way is, um, so it says on the third line, uh, fourth line, it says, acts on the high centers of emotion in the brain. That's a little imprecise, especially since in the second line, they had said acts through neuroendocrine pathway. That's actually pretty, that's pretty scientific sounding. That sounds like they might, might know a little bit about brains and hormones, right? And then they get to the, the fourth line and they go, acts on the high centers of emotion in the brain. <sighs> I don't even know what that means, frankly. So uh, I don't, I wouldn't trust it. And then the next line below it acts locally on the sex organs. Hmm. What does that mean? Right? With premature ejaculation, we don't want our sex organs more sensitive. Are we numbing them? <laughs> like, what's happening? I'm scared. Um, and then finally, regulates the process of ejaculation. Hmm. I'm curious, how, how, what are you doing? I don't know. That's the steps I would go through if I were evaluating something on the internet. And I'd probably stay away from something called premature ejaculation medicine. Instead, what I would be looking for is things that could be prescribed by a regular doctor or even, you know, home, um, naturopath or something like that. Um, there are topical anesthetics that can be placed on the penis. I'd like to point out that that whatever topical anesthetic is placed on the penis has a high probability of transferring over to your partner um, through their mucous membranes. And so you end up with two people with slightly anesthetized genitalia. So I guess nobody's, <laughs> nobody's having any fun. Um, so I'd be a little bit careful about that um, as a treatment. Um, the antidepressants really only work if the reason why that you're having this problem is because you have diagnosable depression or anxiety, and then antidepressants will help with that. If your only symptom is premature ejaculation, you have no other symptoms of anything, uh, antidepressants wouldn't be the go-to treatment. And then it turns out that um, those uh erectile dysfunction treatments that contain phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors actually help 
with premature ejaculation. So the, there are multiple compounds in these um, erectile dysfunction treatments. And uh, so it's not just all erectile dysfunction medication works for this, but um, the ones that contain phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. All right. What about the other side of it? So premature ejaculation. What about erectile dysfunction or what they've started calling ED in the, um, you know, ads and things like that. Back in the olden days, it was called impotence and impotence means no power. So it, you can see the motivation for changing the title um, to erectile dysfunction. And then erectile dysfunction is kind of a mouthful. So they've started calling it ED. The definition of ED is the inability to have an erection or to maintain an erection for penetration. So some people will be diagnosed with erectile dysfunction because they never have erections at all. Other people will be diagnosed with that when they actually can have erections, but they lose their erection before or during penetration, not because of ejaculation, but because uh, they just lose the erection. Now, I want to spend a few minutes talking about transient impotence. They haven't changed the name on this one. Um, and this happens to about 50% of men at some point in their lifetime where they will experience, um, a, you know, erectile dysfunction, it, it, but it's temporary, right? So it's called transient because it's not a new thing that now they have to deal with. It's something that happened for specific reasons and usually for a specific period of time. So for example, drugs can cause transient impotence. Really common culprits are things like alcohol. Alcohol actually interferes with sexual responding. And so, you know, the fact that we often drink before we, you know, have sexual, you know, encounters is kind of funny because it actually can boost the likelihood that we would have in the, on the male side, a loss of erection on the female side, a, a lack of um, responsiveness. Um, certain prescription medications can also cause transient impotence and it usually will give that as a side effect. But if, if a person, if a man were to start tr taking some kind of prescription medication and had this as a side effect, even if their doctor didn't respond, you know, um, report that this should be a side effect, it's important to tell the doctor because it can be a symptom of, um, interfering with blood pressure or blood flow. And so doctors need to hear about that. If, if a person were to start taking something prescribed and then pretty quickly after that they're finding difficulty with erection doctor needs to hear about that you don't want to just go on your own and go well now i'm having now that i started taking that i'm having erectile problems now let's just order some viagra off the internet like you don't want to be doing that you could actually give yourself a lot of big problems if you do that um, heart related problems most of the time um, so certain prescriptions can cause that um, sometimes it, for example, antidepressants can cause erect erectile dysfunction or inhibited sexual desire even. Um, so different kinds of prescriptions can have different kinds of effects. And so it's really important to report those to, to the doctor. And oftentimes they can just change you to a different medication if you tell them that you're having that side effect. Ecstasy is really well known as a, as a um, cause of erectile dysfunction. It's, um, you know, one of those illicit drugs, um, you know, party drug. And a lot of times people will c take ecstasy and they, they're experiencing all this pleasure in touch and tactile things. And, um, you know, lights look so much more interesting and all these great sensation issues are going on when they're using ecstasy and they feel really super cuddly and they just love everybody, but then they're having difficulty with blood flow to their genitals. And it's really common for people who are using ecstasy to then use Viagra because they know that they're going to have difficulty with erection. And people who do that have um, had heart attacks. They've had um, strokes, things like that, because they're mixing two things that are um, having different kinds of effects on the body and they will collide with each other and cause major effects. So be really careful about that. Your mental state can cause transient impotence also. Um, if you're really super tired, you know, if you're experiencing fatigue, it's really hard to have an erection. If you're feeling anxious, right? If you already have your sympathetic nervous system kicked in because you're anxious or you're under stress, then you're not going to be uh, able to, to have that blood flow to the penis that's necessary for erection. So mental state, it can, and it can be very temporary. It could be, you know, 
um, you have an opportunity to have, you know, a sexual, um, you know, liaison with someone and it's very exciting. You want to do it, but then you're worried that you're going to get caught in some way or, um, you know, some kind of those thoughts entering the head can be enough to interfere with blood flow to the penis and interfere with erection. All right, I got this little snap off of a an ad from Viagra that they apparently don't want anybody watching anymore because they realize how um, misleading their <laughs> their ad was. In the ad, they were saying um, that 52% of men um, report some degree of erectile dysfunction. And that's what she's saying out loud. And then they put this at the bottom. And I was like, 52% of men report erectile dysfunction that's enough that they need Viagra for? I'm very skeptical. Where'd, where'd you get this? So I zoomed in on it and I got the their little notation at their bottom of the ad. I cut off the top part of the picture. This isn't what it really looked like on the TV. Um, but so I saw that it came from the Massachusetts male aging study and that there were 1,290 respondents and 52% reported some degree of erectile dysfunction. So I was like, okay, well, let's let, go look up the article, which I, you know, I would argue you, any of you should do this. Look up an actual article. That does not mean go on Google and find somebody's characterization of an article. I mean, like literally you have access to a university library. Look it up. I found the original article from 1994 and I think I have highlights coming. Yeah. And uh, so it says a self-administered sexual activity questionnaire was used to characterize erectile potency. The combined prevalence of minimal, moderate, and complete impotence was 52%. The prevalence of complete impotence, which is a person who can't have an erection ever, tripled from 5 to 15% between subject ages 40 and 70 years. Okay, that's pretty different from the impression the Viagra ad gives us, which is that 52% of men need a Viagra. Um, I, if I recall correctly, her verbal, um, you know, her script was saying that 52% of men over 40 basically need Viagra. And I think we can agree that probably 52% of these men did not need it. Some, some reported minimal and a lot of times men will report transient impotence as minimal because they've had one or two instances where they had difficulty with erection. And the truth is it's in the back of their mind. They're worried, uh-oh, is this the beginning of something that might be you know, an ongoing problem for me? Um, so they might report a, a single or maybe a couple of instances of erectile dysfunction as you know minimal. Uh, moderate probably included men who are reporting more commonly um, that they're having difficulty with erection, or they might be ex um, reporting that they have erections while they're sl asleep at night. The average man has three to four erections per night. When, uh, whenever you're in REM sleep, males get erections and females get vaginal lubrication. It's due to the vas vasocongestion that happens during REM sleep. REM sleep is the part of our sleep where our eyes are darting back and forth. That's why it's called rapid eye movement sleep. Um, and so our eyes are darting back and forth. We're dreaming. Our eyes are not watching the dream just by the way. But if you want to know more about REM sleep, you know, make sure to study your um, states of consciousness. <laughs> but um, the eyes are darting back and forth because they're, they're the only part of the body that aren't, isn't paralyzed during REM sleep. And uh, the reason why we need to be paralyzed during REM sleep is because our, um, our blood pressure goes up. We're, we're thinking thoughts that might make us get up and walk around and do stuff if it weren't for the fact that we were paralyzed. So we look on the outside when we're having REM sleep as if we're dead, except for our eyes rolling back and forth. And, but on the inside, our heart rate's up, our blood pressure is up our breathing is shallow, all the things that you would expect to occur with arousal, whether it's sexual arousal, fear arousal, whatever. And so whenever we enter that REM stage, we get vasocongestion. And uh, so that means for the male, an erect penis, for the female, an erect clitoris. Um, so some men will experience erections overnight but not during the day or when they're wanting erections with a partner. So they would fall into that moderate category. Complete impotence, as they call it there, or erectile dysfunction occurs when you're not having erections overnight 
and you're not having erections during the day, no erections are occurring at all. So between 5 and 15% of men are in that category where they're not experiencing erections at all. I apologize for the, uh, I think it's a goose that we were just hearing. It's my Audubon calendar, my Audubon clock. So erectile dysfunction. um, So the causes of that, we have the psychological and the biological. Um, For a lot of men, okay, first off, I just want to mention that psychologists think that about 80% of the time erectile dysfunction is due to psychological factors. And medical doctors think that about 80% of the time it's biologically based. So you can see that we have like very different takes on erectile dysfunction, that's for sure. Um, For psychologists, we oftentimes will look at relationship issues. Like, is there something going on in the couple that's making the person, the man who's having erectile dysfunction, not want to, you know, in this unconscious way, actually, you know, have sexual contact, sexual relations with their partner? Um, Are they feeling belittled? Are they feeling inadequate? Are they feeling shame? Um, Are they feeling undesired? You know, there, there are a lot of things that could trigger um, feelings within the couple that makes the man not able to, you know, really get into that parasympathetic, you know, I feel calm, I feel valued, I feel, you know, all these things that make me feel like there's nothing, nothing's going to harm me, so that then I can experience arousal. Depression is another um, cause of erectile dysfunction. In fact, um, erectile dysfunction is a symptom of depression. There are lots of symptoms of depression. So if a person is experiencing erectile dysfunction and that's their only symptom, we are not going to diagnose them with depression. We're going to say it's probably something else. Uh, But it is one symptom of depression. And so uh, oftentimes, if we treat the, the psychological depression, the erectile dysfunction goes away as well. And then anxiety. Um, Like I've been mentioning, if you're already in an aroused, you know, anxious state, your sympathetic nervous system is going to prohibit you from getting aroused, right? Because you're already in this heart rate up and it's not attributable to sexual arousal. Um, And so you've got to be in that parasympathetic mindset to get aroused. Now, biologically, there are a lot of causes of erectile dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, which includes, um, and I'm going to mention cardiovascular disease and other circumstances. So I want to clarify that includes heart disease, um, a person who has high blood pressure, um, having clogged arteries in different parts of the body, but in this case, particularly those that um, provide blood to the penis, having high cholesterol levels. These are the kinds of things that go along with, these are part of the constellation of things that are called cardiovascular disease that can also cause erectile dysfunction. Other chronic chronic diseases like um, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease can have erectile dysfunction as side effects. Um, Substance abuse. Again, there's alcohol, right? Alcohol's problematic for sexual functioning. But then tobacco's on that list because tobacco um, constricts your um, peripheral arteries. And so the penis is considered peripheral. So your fingers and toes might be cold because of that constriction and the penis might not be able to have blood flow because of that constriction. Um, Tobacco can also cause buildup of cholesterol or even calcium in your um, arteries that can block blood flow to the penis. And then obesity. Uh, A lot of times obesity goes along with heart disease and high cholesterol also. So it's hard to know for sure if it's just the size of the person's body, or if it's actually what that size is doing to the, um, you know, especially the blood flow parts of their body. So there are a lot of biological causes um, that uh, you might notice are going to be treatable. And then nerve damage. Again, um, I mentioned with premature ejaculation that nerve damage can cause overstimulation, right? So that you're more responsive and, uh, you know, overly responsive. Nerve damage can dull Um, response also. And so the penis may not respond to normal levels of stimulation um, because the penis is for lack of a better term, like numb. So what can we do? Well, psychologically, sensate focus is going to be our go-to, maybe couples therapy if if we um, think that the the source of this problem is some kind of, you know, difficulty between the partners. 
Um, so couples therapy can really help because um, sometimes the sensate focus isn't working well enough when the couple's supposed to be doing it by themselves. Couples therapy, therapy can really boost the effectiveness. Um, on the biological side, okay, there's, this is where we get into a long list. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce different treatments, and then I'll let you watch a little um, promotional video explaining how they work. Um, so if you're interested in seeing exactly how these things work, then please, you know, watch the next video in the playlist. If not, you can just pop back to my next um, segment. Okay, so this, this is what I do in class this day that I teach it to. And it's like, okay, film festival. And uh, <laughs> so the oral medications, you know, the ones that you think of, right, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, there's all, all, also a bunch of, um, uh, what are they called? Um, generic brands also now. They're not nitric oxide enhancers. So I had mentioned Cialis, Viagra, and Levitra for premature ejaculation um, because they contain the... Um, the critical compound that helps with um, premature ejaculation. Not all of the um, the generic brands have that same compound. Testosterone replacement therapy can, can be helpful also. Um, it turns out that you need to have a certain minimum level of testosterone in order to have adequate sexual functioning. And so testosterone replacement might help with that. But most men who start seeking out testosterone replacement turn out if they were to have their testosterone t tested, that they have more than enough testosterone free floating in their blood. Um, we're talking about people who have um, testosterone, you, you know, typically in a, in a healthy man, you're looking at 300 uh, milligrams per liter, I think is the correct um, proportions, you're looking at somebody who has, you know, 50, and then you'd want to do replacement. Um, you're not looking at a person who's at 400 and then just feels like, well, it would be better to be at 600. I mean, it doesn't, you don't treat like that. Um, okay. So now we start getting into my little film festival. So penile injections, uh, I'll let, okay, first off, I'll let this guy explain it to you, but I want you to um, notice how often he uses the word cocked in his demonstration of the penile injection system that he's um, describing. So I'll let you watch that and we can come back and discuss afterwards. 